and Orbiting Human Circus Special, The Second Imaginary Symphony. Thank you to Audible for helping bring The Second Imaginary Symphony to you. For a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial, go to audible.com slash OHC. Taking place at the Javits Center in New York City on June 3rd and 4th, 2017, BookCon is where storytelling and pop culture collide. Guests include Kevin Hart, Veronica Roth, Kristen Ritter, Mark Marin, Mayim Bialik, and many, many more. Go to thebookcon.com for more information and to get tickets. And the Orbiting Human Circus is on tour right now, performing in cities all across the U.S. this May and June, including May 24th in Houston, May 25th in New Orleans, May 26th in Atlanta, May 27th in Athens, Georgia, June 3rd in Boston, and June 4th in New York City. Go to orbitinghumancircus.com for upcoming dates and tickets. And now, this is episode two. Hoggy Plum here. You are listening to part two of the PBC's broadcast of the Second Imaginary Symphony. It is, of course, Platypus Night, the night in our month-long lead-up to Platypus Eve, where all Paris goes dark, the city of lights is extinguished, and one finds not a single lit electric light or candle. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, at the strike of eight in two hours' time. Parisians will gather with friends, with loved ones, with only the moonlight to light their way, and later this evening, waiting, all of us waiting. And for whom do we wait? Well, for those of you listening to this international broadcast in some remote enclave, such as a mountaintop, jungle cavern, or perhaps one of the Earth's poles, we are waiting for the great recitating platypus. Yes, on this night the platypus travels the Earth looking not for signs of stuffy noses or sickness, but for darkened houses. The dark house being a sign that the dwellers within are inviting the platypus to visit. And we wait. Our eyes close as if in unison. When the platypus enters your home, each of us is entranced by a feeling of absolute peace. The platypus will move through selecting certain objects, one for each of us, and touching them to its bill. And when the platypus leaves our house and we all open our eyes at exactly the same time, we light a candle and place it in our window. And all of Paris spills out into the streets, and in the streets all of Paris wonders just which object the platypus has touched for them. And we go through our bedrooms and we go through our living rooms from thing to thing. We ask... Is this the object the platypus blessed? For when you see that object, one will suddenly be seized with the same unmistakable feeling of warmth and safety one felt when the platypus had just left our house. A memory or idea will pass into our heads, and that will be the key to our well-being and happiness in the coming year. And indeed, in times of struggle or adversity, if the object is touched, the path to follow will come. And all of this tonight. But first, part two of our classic holiday broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Second Imaginary Symphony. This raincoat is for use only in the most severe of drought emergencies. Now, I had never heard of a raincoat that was only to be used in the most severe of drought emergencies before, and was quite visibly shaken by the severity of Mr. Ackerman's tone. You didn't, didn't, stammered Nye. I didn't what? Tell me about the raincoat. I didn't. Oh, my God, I, I didn't. And there the two of them stood, neither boy nor man, knowing quite what to say. Mr. Ackerman sighed a sigh of such sadness that it made Nye shiver. 
I, I'm sorry, Nye. I, I shouldn't have yelled at you like that. I had no right. I was afraid you were about to... Mr. Ackerman trailed off, and with a look of embarrassment upon his face, knelt down to the height of the little boy. I'm afraid I'm, I'm just not feeling very well right now, Nye. You've been a very good boy today. You know that, don't you? Nye shook his head yes, because the way Mr. Ackerman was looking at him, he thought he ought to. I think old Mr. Ackerman needs a little rest now, he said to Nye. You won't forget what I told you here today, will you, Nye? Nye shook his head no. Okay, Nye. You go run along and play now. And so it was that Nye became the guardian of a great and profound secret. In the weeks and months that passed, Nye never looked at the big factory or the clouds above in exactly the same way again. The world seemed a new and exotic place to Nye, where new mysteries waited to be discovered around every corner. He would spend hours on the hill overlooking the big factory, watching the newborn clouds drift this way and that. In the evenings, he would sit out on his front stoop, anxiously awaiting Mr. Ackerman's return home from work. It was the complicit look that he and Mr. Ackerman would share that he looked forward to most of all. Nye felt very lucky indeed to be the bearer of such a great and important secret, and dreamed someday of becoming a cloud maker himself. Cloud making seemed so much more interesting than the other jobs he had learned about at career day in school. When asked, Mr. Ackerman just shrugged and said, Not anybody can be a cloud maker, Nye. Sure, most anyone is capable. But the title of Cloudmaker is something that must be earned. Right now, you're just a passenger, along for the ride. A passenger? asked Nye. This world, Nye, this world of men and women, said Mr. Ackerman, his cheeks and nose a good deal redder than Nye had ever seen them before. Little boys like you, you're nothing but passengers. Mr. Ackerman was quiet for a moment, seemingly struggling to find the right words. It's like, like a crazy carnival ride. Gone out of control, he said, his eyes widening. It's all our fault. Your fault? asked Nye. Mr. Ackerman laughed a sad laugh. You know who built this crazy machine who's operating it? he asked. Nye shook his head. Grown-ups, Mr. Ackerman said, bowing deeply. We build the damn thing every day. Problem is, most of us don't even know it. Even though we're driving, each and every last one of us, we think we're just passengers like you, or worse, victims. We're terrible drivers, the whole lot of us. But sometimes, Nye, Sometimes, a little boy like you grows up and finds that despite everything, he can still see clearly. He finds that he can look straight ahead and steer the whole blessed thing. And when a boy can do that, he can be... A cloud maker? Asked Nye. Any damn thing he pleases, finished Mr. Ackerman. Nye thought about how before meeting Mr. Ackerman, he had been afraid of growing up. He enjoyed how he spent his days, and was yet to find a grown-up who did. Watching the grown-ups travel to and from work every day, he had witnessed looks only of boredom and stress upon their faces. Nye was always amazed by how well Mr. Ackerman was able to mimic this look of discontentment, how well he was able to mask his heroic purpose and disappeared daily into the ceaseless flow of adults who had made the whole idea of growing up look so unappealing to Nye in the first place. Mr. Ackerman was indeed so good at appearing tired and unhappy that sometimes for fleeting moments, even Nye himself was fooled. And then, early one vacation morning, Nye awoke to find something horribly wrong. 
Mr. Ackerman's hat and briefcase were strewn upon his front lawn, and the door to his house left hanging wide open. Through the open door, Nye could see that Mr. Ackerman's wooden coat rack had also been capsized and was laying on its side. Nye cautiously approached the house and called out to Mr. Ackerman. Mr. Ackerman, called Nye. There was no answer. Mr. Ackerman, he called yet again, poking his head through the front door. And still there was no answer. The house was completely silent. Nye, becoming more and more concerned, decided to ask his grandmother if she had heard Mr. Ackerman leaving for work that morning. Unfortunately, she had been busy splicing tape and hadn't noticed anything at all. Nye thought for a moment of asking his grandmother's help, but was afraid of compromising Mr. Ackerman's important need for secrecy. He would have to try and find Mr. Ackerman by himself for now. Nye returned to Mr. Ackerman's front yard, and gathering the hat and briefcase, cautiously entered the house. Closing the door behind him, Nye placed the hat and briefcase upon Mr. Ackerman's kitchen table and began searching about for any clues as towards Mr. Ackerman's whereabouts. Finding nothing out of the ordinary, with the exception of the capsized coat rack and raincoat, he returned once again to the briefcase. Hesitating for a moment, Nye decided that there was no other choice. The briefcase must be opened. After all, he thought, Mr. Ackerman might be in trouble. Nye gently released the latches and was quite surprised by what he found. Inside the case, a second slightly smaller case was housed, this one ice cold and made out of some sort of aluminum or other light metal. Upon this metal was etched the phrase, For authorized personnel only. Underneath this statement was etched a good deal more information. The etching was so small, however, that Nye had to press his face up against the ice-cold case and strain his eyes in order to read it. Warning, it said, for the ground transportation and containment of nimbus, stratus, cirrus, and cumulus clouds only, not to be opened in an unrefrigerated indoor environment. As Nye was straining to read the last part of this statement, his nose accidentally made contact with a small red button that he had not previously noticed. Suddenly, Nye's ears were filled with the sound of gears turning, and a mechanical whirring filled the air. The case sprung open, and out of it sprung a tiny and perfectly formed nimbus cloud. It was the most amazing thing Nye had ever seen. The little cloud drifted upwards, drifting higher and higher, until at last it came to a rest against the cool tiles of the kitchen ceiling. Nye pulled out his chair and climbed upon the kitchen table in order to take a better look. From his new vantage point, however, it seemed as though the little cloud had not come to a rest at all, but was trying to pass through the tile ceiling in order to reach the sky above. Nye noticed also that the cloud seemed just a little bit smaller than it had been only moments ago. It was almost as if the cloud's inability to reach its proper altitude was causing it to somehow shrink. Then the words etched on the aluminum cloud case suddenly came back to him. Not to be opened in an unrefrigerated indoor environment. What will Mr. Ackerman think when he finds out that I destroyed his cloud? Nye was reminded of the time a bird had found its way into his grandmother's house and the horrible panic he had felt as the bird flapped about, crashing into closed windows. He had to do something, and quickly. But the cloud was much too high and well beyond reach. How would he ever get the cloud back down and into its cloud case? Then Nye thought of Mr. Ackerman's old-fashioned refrigerator. Perhaps this could provide the sort of refrigerated environment that the cloud needed. Filling his lungs with as much air as he could muster, Nye began to blow the little cloud in the direction of Mr. Ackerman's icebox. It's working, thought Nye. It's working. Nye blew and blew until the cloud was floating just a few feet above the refrigerator door. Nye was hoping that the cloud would be drawn into the coolness of the icebox 
as it would the coolness of high altitudes. However, upon opening Mr. Ackerman's refrigerator door, he found no room whatsoever for the little cloud. It seems the refrigerator was already full, not with a single grocery, mind you, but from top to bottom with clouds. Clouds of every imaginable shape and size. Stratus clouds and cirrus clouds. So many clouds, in fact, that Nye had to immediately slam the refrigerator door shut in order to keep them from pouring out. Just then, Nye felt the most amazing cool sensation on the top of his head. The truant little cloud had begun to lose altitude and was now hovering only centimeters away from his face. Nye grabbed the cloud case off the kitchen table and held it open beneath the sinking cloud. He closed the aluminum case around it and placed it directly back inside of Mr. Ackerman's briefcase, closing all the latches. This is getting me nowhere, thought Nye, who with a great sigh of relief decided to resume his search for Mr. Ackerman outside. You were listening to part two of the second imaginary symphony. The Perpetual Broadcasting Corporation will be going off the air in observance of the platypus night. This is August Plum in the Perpetual Broadcasting Corporation. Good night. grateful to Audible for helping us share the Second Imaginary Symphony with you. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original shows, news, comedy, and more. And audiobooks are perfect to listen to whether you're scaling a French national monument without pulleys, ropes, or wires, or just mopping its grand ballroom. Audible is offering you a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial. Just go to audible.com OHC, download a title for free, and start listening. I've been listening to Swing Time by Zadie Smith, a story about dance and growing up and the impossible contradiction-filled search for identity. To listen to this book or anything else available on Audible, go to audible.com slash OHC for a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial. That's audible.com slash OHC. And we'd like to tell you about BookCon, the event where storytelling and pop culture collide. Taking place at the Javits Center in New York City on June 3rd and 4th, BookCon is an immersive experience that invites you to interact with the authors, publishers, celebrities, and content creators that influence everything we read, hear, and see. It features autograph sessions, special screenings, literary quiz shows, and so much more. Like a panel featuring Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner and more from the cast of Welcome to Night Vale. BookCon is the ultimate celebration of books where your favorite stories come to life. Go to thebookcon.com for tickets. That's thebookcon.com. We're also excited to tell you about PodCon, a podcasting convention that celebrates podcasting as an art form. We here at the Orbiting Human Circus are so grateful to get to make this kind of art, and we can't wait to see everything this medium can become, and to celebrate it with all of you who love it just as much as we do. PodCon was created by Night Vale Presents, Hank and John Green, and the McElroy Brothers, and there's an Indiegogo right now in support of its launch at PodCon.com. That's PodCon.com. 
and come visit your friends, the janitor, the narrator, the orchestral, and more, and walk into the world of the Orbiting Human Circus this May and June. For upcoming dates, see orbitinghumancircus.com slash shows. And finally, check out orbitinghumancircus.com slash shop for OHC t-shirts and posters and new Second Imaginary Symphony t-shirts, available for a limited time. The Second Imaginary Symphony is written, directed, and audio produced by Julian Coster, performed by Brian Dewan, and produced for podcasting by Christy Grussman. With Augustus Plum as himself, Second Imaginary Symphony music by Julian Coster and the Music Tapes, and Perpetual Broadcasting Corporation music by Thomas Hughes. For more information, go to orbitinghumancircus.com or search for Orbiting Human Circus on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. The Orbiting Human Circus is part of the Night Vale Presents Network. To learn more, go to nightvalepresents.com.